Good morning. I'm Darrell West, uh, a Vice President of Governance Studies and Director of the Center for Technology Innovation at the Brookings Institution. And I would like to welcome you to our forum on facial recognition. So software that identifies faces is being used in airports, retail establishments, and by law enforcement. It's raised many questions about privacy, surveillance, and bias. Uh, some cities uh, already have enacted limits or outright bans on the use of facial recognition by local law enforcement. Uh, others believe that bans go too far and are thinking instead about how to enact guardrails in order to protect people's privacy. So today we are honored to welcome two senators to Brookings who have introduced the bipartisan Facial Recognition Technology Warrant Act. Uh, that bill requires federal law enforcement to get a court order before using facial recognition on targeted ongoing public surveillance of individuals. Uh, Senator Chris Coons is a Democrat who represents Delaware, and he was elected to the Senate in 2010. He serves on Senate Appropriations, Foreign Relations, and Judiciary, among other uh, committees. Uh, he's been a leader in expanding access to technical training and higher education. He's a co-founder of the Senate Law Enforcement Caucus. When he was in Delaware, uh, he uh, uh, served for the second largest law enforcement agency uh, within uh, the state, and he's been a longtime proponent of figuring out how to protect civil liberties uh, during the digital era in which we live. Senator Mike Lee is a Republican who represents Utah. He also was elected in 2010. He serves on Senate Judiciary, Commerce, and Energy and Natural Resources, among other committees. And he has been a leader on issues concerning economic prosperity, uh, fiscal responsibility, personal uh, uh, liberty, and uh, digital issues. Each of them are going to outline their uh, thoughts on facial recognition and uh, the latest uh, legislation uh, they have uh, introduced, and then uh, 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 Nicole Turner Lee and I will have some uh, questions for them. So we will start with Senator Coons. I, I note the rousing applause. <laughs> Good morning, everybody. Welcome to Brookings. What a gorgeous day to have a conversation about technology, civil liberties, civil rights, and public safety. I'm Senator Chris Coons from Delaware, and um, I am honored to be joined by my friend and colleague, uh, Senator Mike Lee of Utah. Uh, thank you, Daryl, for that uh, introduction, um, and thank you to Brookings for hosting and to Dr. Uh, Nicole Turner Lee uh, for moderating, um, and to Leti Davalos and the Center for Technology and in Innovation here at Brookings uh, for helping facilitate uh, today's conversation. As we all know, technology uh, is accelerating um, in its ability to gather data about us everywhere, all the time, in some of the most intrusive ways possible. Uh, I am literally, willfully, willingly, I should say, uh, carrying with me a device that is essential to daily life. And uh, I can, frankly, barely navigate uh, driving around town or communicating with my family or staying in touch with my office or shopping without this thing. But it is also carrying... Um, a real-time tracking and monitoring device, a listening device, a device that sends data really every second of every day about exactly where I am, what floor I am on in a building, what building I'm at, how fast I'm going, where I've parked my car. And we all know this, but it is worth refocusing for a moment on the fact that the United States and our history as a constitutional Republic as a society that has chosen to order itself according to some core principles has long had to strike a balance uh, between civil liberties and public safety. Um, and while these advances in ways I just described are making our lives remarkably easier, it's also critical that we understand the real costs that come um, with these increases and in advances in technology. Today we're focusing on one of those new technologies, facial recognition. Uh, and we're having conversations uh, in Congress about how a federal framework can help start this conversation and possibly strike the right balance between public safety, efficiency, privacy, and our constitutional rights. This conversation about fa facial recognition, uh, I think, is long overdue. Facial recognition is a valuable tool for law enforcement. It helps keep us safe. The ability to quickly deploy facial recognition software has the potential um, in a wide range of cases, um, obviously in the case of a terrorist who's just bombed a major public event like the Boston Marathon, the ability to track them um, and apprehend them quickly 
is a critical tool uh, in the toolkit for federal law enforcement. The ability to find someone with Alzheimer's who, who has wandered away from um, their family, from a caregiving situation, the ability to quickly identify um, a child uh, who is believed to have been kidnapped and be at risk of being exploited. There are positive use cases uh, for facial recognition technology. But if left unregulated, facial recognition technology also has the potential to invade the everyday privacy of literally every American and every person in this nation. The ability to be tracked or identified without your knowledge or consent in public at any point at any time I think creates obvious and significant Fourth Amendment concerns. Problems with the accuracy and bias inherent in this technology also create significant civil rights concerns. Um, so we have to have rules in place that strike the right balance between civil liberties and civil rights and public safety. Um, right now, that conversation mostly revolves around two poles. Either law enforcement can use this rapidly emerging technology that is very forceful in any way they choose, any time they choose, or it has to be completely banned. Um, so far, a few municipalities have enacted bans. There's just the beginnings of a conversation uh, by one presidential candidate about a complete federal ban. Uh, but somewhere between these two poles of a Wild West where this powerful technology is unregulated and one where it's completely banned has to be a meaningful conversation. So my bill with Senator Lee um, suggests how to set rules around one particular application of facial recognition technology when federal law enforcement uses it to surveil a particular individual over time. Targeted, persistent tracking creates significant Fourth Amendment concerns and can run up against our legitimate expectations of privacy. So our bill would make it so that federal law enforcement can't use facial recognition technology to conduct individually targeted surveillance without first showing probable cause. This is a common sense approach that sets procedural guardrails similar to those set in other cases of intrusive searches by law enforcement. So here's the bottom line. Our bill is the beginning of a conversation. You may know that we both serve on the Senate Judiciary Committee together. You may have the general impression that there's not much going on on the Senate Judiciary Committee except fighting over nominations and some other important thing that's going on in the House that's about to take up a whole lot of our time and energy. Um, I cannot tell you how grateful I am to have a colleague uh, who is willing to look past some of our deep current partisan divides and recognize that this is a significant challenge facing our nation and, frankly, our world. Um, the other major committee on which I serve is foreign relations. And I'll tell you, as someone uh, who led a congressional delegation to China, Taiwan, Japan, South Korea earlier this year, and who has spent a lot of time on the continent of Africa, I am struck at how quickly um, the capabilities of digital surveillance and of the control of populations is spreading throughout the world. Um, and I think it is critical that the United States demonstrate what is possible in a constitutionally ordered republic that is committed to the balance between civil liberties and civil rights and public safety to show the world it is possible to deploy these rapidly emerging technologies in a way that still protects space for individuals to live their lives and to express themselves in ways that protect individual liberty and freedom. Um, I look forward to continuing to work with members of law enforcement, with civil rights and privacy advocates, and with industry to get this right. And more than anything, I look forward to working with my friend and colleague, Senator Lee. Thank you very much. Let me turn it over to the Senator. Thank you very much. Uh, it really is an honor and a privilege to be here at Brookings, especially with my friend, Chris Coons. Chris is someone who I've deeply enjoyed working with over the nine years that he and I have served in the Senate. Uh, he's someone who enjoys and commands an enormous amount of respect along every end of the political spectrum and is one of the most uh, well-liked and beloved members of the United States Senate uh, uh, by Republicans and Democrats alike. When Senator Coons and I first work, started working on this legislation, we uh, decided that it was important to find uh, uh, a reasonable approach to balancing the interests that we have at stake here. Uh, the, the, the obvious civil liberties uh, concerns that Americans have um, uh, and that it provides to law enforcement is a very significant thing. It's, it's something that we shouldn't ignore. We always have to recognize that as technology advances, as it makes government more efficient, that can be a good thing. At the same time, 
as that happens, as government becomes more efficient, uh, potential for abuse escalates dramatically. Um, I, I, I sometimes look for uh, simple analogies from popular culture to remind me of why I want certain types of reforms in government. Uh, one of the uh, best analogies that I can think of in some of these areas dealing with civil liberties is, of course, the Stay Puff Marshmallow Man um, from the original Ghostbusters movie. If you remember, yeah, yeah, exactly. How could you not think of that? If you remember at the, at the end of the movie, uh, if they're told by this deceased uh, demon demigod, um, don't think of anything because whatever you think of right now is going to result because of some kind of curse in that thing becoming large and destructive. And they all said, okay, we're not going to think of anything. And apparently one of the Ghostbusters thought of the Stay Puft Marshmallow Man, who by the time they noticed it coming was the size of a skyscraper and was stepping on houses, automobiles, churches, everything in its way. This is in some ways rem reminiscent of the risks associated with our individual liberties and government. When government grows big, when government becomes destructive of our liberties, it isn't always that the government itself hates us or that it's bent on doing evil, at least not in our country, at least not all of the time. Sometimes that is the case, but uh, sometimes it isn't. Sometimes it's just because he's the Stave Puff Marshmallow Man, and he's as big as a skyscraper, and he's clumsy, and your house or your automobile or your church or your synagogue or mosque happens to be in the way. This is one of those areas where I think uh, we run into some risk there. Well, many of us might prefer a moratorium on the use of fa facial recognition without a warrant. We think this legislation uh, that uh, we've developed comes a long way in, develop in, in protecting American civil liberties and providing clear guidelines to law enforcement uh, where none currently exist. So this is a big area. It's one that we realize we can't conquer in one fell swoop, but we think this bill goes a long way. It's a positive step in the right direction. While federal, state, and local governments have many different uses, uh, different legitimate uses for facial recognition technology, this legislation narrowly targets just the use of facial recognition technology for targeted ongoing surveillance conducted over a period of 72 hours. Due to the many uses of facial recognition technology, we decided to focus this bill on uh, uh, only that type of targeted ongoing surveillance, uh, it, meaning for more than 72 hours, because we feel that it raises Fourth Amendment interests um, uh, comparable to those that were at issue in, in both the Jones case and the Carpenter case. Unfortunately, in both Jones and Carpenter, uh, the court declined to formulate a bright line rule uh, regarding the precise point at which tracking becomes a search. Nonetheless, th there are some clues that we can take from Jones v. Carpenter, uh, and from both Jones and Carpenter. For example, in the Supreme Court's 2012 ruling in the United States versus Jones, uh, we had a case that involved the use of GPS tracking to monitor the movements of a car over a period of 28 days. And the court analyzed uh, this surveillance uh, uh, un under the reasonable expectation of privacy test. In concluding that this surveillance violated the Fourth Amendment, Justice Alito's concurring opinion explained that the use of longer-term GPS monitoring and investigations of most offenses impinges on expectations of privacy. For such offenses, society's expectation has been that law enforcement agents and others would not, and indeed in the main, simply could not, secretly monitor and catalog every single movement of an individual's car for a very long period. In this case, for four weeks, law enforcement agents tracked every movement that the respondent made in the vehicle he was driving. We need not identify with precision the point at which the tracking of this vehicle became a search, for the line was surely crossed long before the four-week mark. So uh, Justice Alito's concurring opinion doesn't say that there wasn't a breach prior to that. But he's saying certainly at some point prior to the end of that four weeks, it was crossed. In Carpenter versus United States, in, in uh, 
a case decided just last year. While the court found that the government's access to 127 days of self-site location information obtained from a wireless carrier without a warrant violated the uh, individual's reasonable expectation of privacy, the court failed to create a bright line rule of how many hours worth of cell phone site location information is sufficiently intrusive to intrude on the person's reasonable expectation of privacy. Due to the fact that facial recognition technology relies on the use of cameras in public places, it may in some ways, due to the fact that it operates in public, uh, not present exactly the same type or, in some cases, the same degree of invasiveness uh, or, or, or the same type of comprehensive picture of a person's life, as does cell site location uh, or, or GPS data. Nevertheless, we believe that this does present its own type of invasiveness. In some ways, it's not as bad in the sense that, in theory, once you go in your home, uh, they're, they're uh, let's all hope and pray, uh, will, will not be cameras, uh, public cameras monitoring your every move within your home. On the other hand, it can also be more invasive in the sense that they, they can tell your facial expression, something about your mood, something about what you're wearing, what you're holding, what you're eating, that the GPS and cell site location data can't. And so uh, they, they present comparable but substantively different risks. Uh, both significant risks to our individual liberties. So our goals with this legislation were to protect Americans' reasonable expectation of privacy in this area with regard to facial recognition, providing a clear standard, at least one of uh, what will eventually become many clear standards, uh, for federal law enforcement uh, for circumstances where they must seek a warrant if they want to use FRT. Our decision to focus on ongoing surveillance does not mean that we don't have any concerns with other uses of facial recognition technology. Quite to the contrary, we've both joined Senate Homeland Security and Government Affairs Chairman and Ranking Member, uh, uh, the Chairman, Senator Johnson, and the Ranking Member, Senator Peters, in a letter to both the Department of Homeland Security and the FBI requesting information uh, regarding their request to check photographs against driver's license databases uh, within several states, including my state of Utah. We simply do not believe that a single one-size-fits-all approach to facial recognition would be effective. More to the point, we know that this is a place where we can start. And if we can start cabining off piece by piece areas where government should not act and where it could and inevitably would, invade our civil liberties, we can start there. That's what we're doing. Thank you. Thanks for watching. Be sure to like and subscribe for more videos from Brookings.